press they control it? You do it? Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh, we had Great. Hello. Oh, great. Hi. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Hillary Lewis, and I'm the Steel Director at Industrious Labs. I'm happy to have everyone here today for a panel discussion about the health and climate impacts of the potential sale of U.S. steel. This conversation is very timely with recent announcements of the first green steel investment in the United States just two weeks ago from the Department of Energy. Uh, with Japanese Prime Minister Kishida's official state visit happening this Wednesday, and with the U.S. Steel shareholder vote happening this Friday. Um, this event is co-hosted with the Sierra Club and Mighty Earth, and I'm honored to welcome you all here today on behalf of all of our organizations. U.S. Steel is one of just two steelmaking companies left in the U.S. that still uses coal-based furnaces. As a brief reminder of the steelmaking process, today 70% of steel globally is made in blast furnaces. Blast furnaces make iron by reducing iron ore with cooked coal, also known as coke, that is then processed into steel. This centuries-old technology releases enormous amounts of both climate and health-harming pollution and is responsible for approximately 11% of global emissions. And just for context, the United States as a country is about 13%. U.S. Steel's singular footprint is also significant. Its operations emit over 19 million metric tons of CO2e, annually, which is equivalent to about five coal-fired power plants, and thousands of tons of hazardous air pollutants that disproportionately harm American communities of color and low-income communities. U.S. Steel currently operates two blast furnaces in the Mon Valley near Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania and four blast furnaces in Gary in northwest Indiana. In addition, they own and operate the biggest coking plant in the U.S., which is also in the Mon Valley in Pennsylvania, which produces about a third of all coke made in the United States. U.S. Steel also owns a mini mill in Arkansas, as well as a number of smaller steel-related facilities. For the purposes of this conversation, though, we're mostly going to be talking about their steel-based assets. I also want to note that U.S. Steel announced plans to indefinitely idle its blast furnace at Granite City Works in Illinois in November 2023. The lack of investment at this facility is putting over a thousand jobs at risk and must be addressed in the context of this sale. Unfortunately, lack of investment is a theme for U.S. Steel, and not just in Granite City. In the shadow of major investments announced globally and in the U.S. to transition the industry to fossil-free steelmaking, U.S. Steel has yet to make any meaningful investments or plans for investments that would remove fossil fuels from its iron-making operations. Zeroing in on the sale, I also wanted to remind everyone about the general timeline and status of the U.S. Steel sale. In August 2023, U.S. Steel announced that it would begin a strategic review process after receiving numerous unsolicited bids for part or all of the company. Cleveland Cliffs quickly followed by announcing that it had made a private offer to buy U.S. Steel in July of the same year that was rejected. U.S. Steel offered companies globally the opportunity to submit proposals as part of the review process. In December 2023, the board concluded the strategic review and announced that it would move forward with an offer from Nippon Steel, a Japanese steel company that already had a small footprint in the United States. The deal is valued at approximately $14 billion, far more than the trading value of the company at the time of the announcement. So far this year, the public conversation about the potential merger has focused on concerns about national security and jobs. I also want to acknowledge that Cleveland Cliffs has the exclusive support of the United Steelworkers that represent thousands of U.S. steelworkers. The Sierra Club, Mighty Earth, and Industrious Labs support American steelworkers in their efforts to ensure that all existing labor agreements are upheld through any transaction and see our efforts to bring climate and health into the conversation as complementary to their demands. In response to steelworker and for foreign ownership concerns, President Biden announced that he opposed the deal in March 2023. He said, and I quote, it is important that we maintain strong American steel companies powered by American steel workers. I told our steel, steel workers I have their backs and I meant it. U.S. Steel has been an iconic American steel company for more than a century, and it is vital for it to remain an American steel company that is domestically owned and operated. However, the deal is moving forward and is currently undergoing review by the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States, CFIUS, 
and the Justice Department, which is investigating the deal for antitrust concerns. Nippon Steel and U.S. Steel maintain that the deal is expected to close in early fall, while some analysts believe that it will not close until after the election. Because of the huge toll that coal-based steel making takes on both climate and health, it is critical that these concerns play a central role in discussions and decisions around the future of U.S. Steel. These facilities badly need investment, but what investments will, com will companies make? Importantly, any company can invest in cleaner steel making alternatives. However, none of the parties involved have provided concrete plans to do so. In light of these concerns and following President Biden's announcement, a coalition of climate, environmental justice, and consumer advocacy organizations sent a letter to the Biden administration urging them to evaluate potential mergers and acquisitions in the domestic steel industry through a health and climate lens. The implications of any potential deal touches both the president's climate goal of reducing uh, 50 to reducing of achieving reducing 50 to 50 percent 50 to 52 percent reduction uh, from 20 from 2005 levels in economy-wide net greenhouse gas pollution in 2030 and the environmental justice goal of ensuring 40 percent of the overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized by underinvestment and overburdened by pollution. The letter, which is available in the room and also online, outlines the general principles and commitments necessary for a climate and health aligned deal. I'm excited now to welcome uh, energy reporter and author of the Daily Generate newsletter, Ben Geeman from Axios, um, and our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can everybody hear me? Great. So yes, uh, as Hillary said, I am Ben Geeman. I am an energy and climate reporter with Axios. And um, as Hillary walked us through, I'm, I'm really excited about this discussion because I think it's super timely for, for the reasons she mentioned. And I think this is just such a crucial story um, from a climate standpoint, from an environmental health and justice standpoint, it's a crucial story from a geopolitical standpoint and from a labor standpoint as well. So for all those sort of interlocking reasons, I'm really psyched to introduce our panel. I'm going to introduce them one at a time. They're going to give a little bit of opening remarks. And then we'll move on to some questions, both uh, from myself and from the audience. And hopefully we'll have a good and uh, freewheeling conversation. So our first panelist is Yang Kwan, who is the senior policy advisor in the industrial transformation campaign at the Sierra Club, where he has a major focus on steel and also has deep experience and knowledge of the trade and industrial policy landscape. So with that, let's have a few opening remarks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Vice President Quinn will speak about national security, and I hope to start up uh, the discussion with some comments on uh, climate change, which is a human security challenge. Uh, as an environmental organization, the Sierra Club believes that all primary steel manufacturers can and must uh, deliver iron made without coke within the next decade. This, of course, includes the U.S. Steel Company and Nippon Steel. Uh, let's take a quick step back. People often say something along the lines of, we've made iron steel the same way for thousands and thousands of years. This, of course, is a generalization. The iron and steel industry has always been evolving with society's needs. 300 years ago, iron smelters around the world used charcoal, which is produced by baking wood. Japanese audiences might be familiar with the Tatara furnaces used during the Edo period. These furnaces use charcoal. Because making iron with charcoal requires so much wood, it often contributed to deforestation in places where there were furnaces. For those who are familiar, this is the backdrop of Hayao Miyazaki's movie, Princess Mononoke. Just a drop there. In the 18th century, iron makers in England discovered that using coke made from baking coal could be used instead of charcoal. This meant that forests did not have to be logged to make iron. And this is how we ended up with iron making blast furnaces using coke today. But as people 300 years ago understood that using charcoal led to deforestation, we know now that the use of coke contributes to climate change. 8% of global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from the steel industry much of it from blast furnaces using coke. This does not begin to take into consideration the, to take into account the extensive releases of toxic pollution that devastate local community health, which I hope my co-panelist Jermaine Patterson will be able to speak about in greater de detail when she arrives. Focusing on climate change, I don't think I need to list a number of ways that the changing climate will affect our collective well-being. It means devastating changes to our ability to grow food, the death of ecosystems that we rely on for food, ingredients for medicine and biodiversity, and other serious calamities that will carry a human cost. 
and the planet is getting warmer faster than previously anticipated. The Journal of Advances in Atmospheric Sciences published an article that showed that oceans were warmer than any time observed since, 20, 19, since the 1950s in 2023. We can also see it ourselves in the death of 90% of Florida's coral reefs in the last 40 years. The research organization Rhodium Group found that the U.S. economy-wide emissions declined by 1.9% in 2023 from 2022 levels, partially thanks to the declining generation from coal power plants. But our rate of decline needs to more than triple and sustain at the level every year from 2024 through 2030 in order to meet the U.S. climate target under the Paris Agreement of a 50% reduction in emissions from 2005 levels to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Here we discovered that the U.S. industrial sector emissions is one reason why our national emissions are not falling faster. Industrial emissions actually increased by 1.2% in 2023 over 2022 levels. Within the industrial sector, the steel industry can do more to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by adopting new technologies. Using data from a pilot facility in Sweden that is using hydrogen-based direct reduced iron technology, we see that greenhouse gas emissions decrease from 1,600 kilograms per ton of crude steel from traditional steel making to 25 kilograms per ton. That's a 98% decrease. Commercial scale plants are under construction in Europe and the US Department of Energy announced that it is in negotiations with the company SSAB to provide public funding for the construction of the first commercial scale hydrogen based direct reduced iron making facility in North America in Mississippi. In this environment, Nippon Steel's current plan to adopt hydrogen direct reduced iron making around 2040 and in the meantime, continue to use coke in blast furnaces that are made slightly more efficiently is tantamount to announcing its intention to go back to making iron with charcoal. Its ambitions are inconsistent with the goals we must achieve to safeguard human security. It is for this reason that Sierra Club raises concerns about the company's intention to purchase the U.S. Steel Company. We do not see Nippon Steel as a responsible steward of these facilities that must be transitioned from coke and we will apply the same criteria to judge other bids for the facilities owned by the U.S. Steel Company. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that very much lays out both the daunting environmental and climate challenges associated with steel, but also on a more optimistic note, the fact that there are uh, technological solutions if companies and policymakers choose to adopt them. Um, from there, I wanted to turn to another dimension of this. Um, on the national security side of things, we have Joe Quinn, who leads the Center for Strategic Industrial Materials at SAFE, which is securing America's future energy. And he also has firsthand knowledge and experience working in the metals industry itself. So with that, Joe, please take it away. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, SAFE is an energy security think tank committed to transportation and energy policy solutions that ensure the economic and national security of the United States, its partners, and its allies. We believe the world is transitioning from a fossil-based to a minerals-based economy that will require an ever-growing supply of critical minerals and materials, specifically steel. In the coming decade, where steel comes from and how it is produced will have a profound consequence on America's national security and economic competitiveness. SAFE was founded in 2004 to develop and advocate for policies to improve America's energy and national security. Our initial focus was ending dependence on oil by using less of it and diversifying to other cleaner sources of energy, which evolved into an emphasis on electrification. As we pursued these goals, we realized that the United States would soon reach a point where it risked trading dependence on Saudi oil for dependence on Chinese critical minerals. The People's Republic of China dominates nearly all aspects of critical material supply chain, from mining and processing to advanced component production, manufacturing, and recycling. This is true for steel. Now, I realize we're here today to talk about Japan and U.S. steel issues, but from our point of view, we should move away from this allies versus allies and focus more on allies versus adversaries. The demand for steel is on the rise. According to the American Iron and Steel Institute, domestic steel demand increased 15 million tons from 2020 to 21, and an additional 8 million tons from 21 to 22. And then came the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act. Steel is an extremely important strategic material, considering its role in both defense technology and the clean energy transition. For clean energy, steel is used in solar panels, wind turbines, and other clean technologies. 
Because of the IRA, a report by the Rocky Mountain Institute projected domestic steel demand to increase by 40 million tons by the end of the decade. China dominates the global steel market, producing 45% of the global steel and 68% of the world's primary steel. This makes the United States and its allies vulnerable to market manipulation and supply risk. As demand continues to increase, it will become more important to think about which countries fill the growing gap between demand and domestic supply. The alliance between the United States and Japan is, as the U.S. State Department phrased it, the cornerstone of U.S. security interests in Asia. SAFE believes that the U.S. should prioritize domestic and allied sourcing for supply of critical materials, including steel. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. And now we are going to move on to Aaron Brickman, who is the senior principal with the U.S. program at the clean energy think tank, RMI. And um, that's, an that's a program and organization that looks to accelerate clean energy and has spent a lot of years uh, doing that successfully. Um, but he also brings a lot of uh, private sector experience and also experience from within the Commerce Department that will help uh, inform his views on this and what he has to say. So please, uh, please take it away, Aaron. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, RMI, also known as the Rocky Mountain Institute, um, uh, of that report that uh, the Vice President just mentioned uh, moments ago. So uh, yeah, there's a lot at stake and uh, it's a great conversation to have, uh, thrilled to be part of it. So. Because of my background in economic development and competitiveness and investment and trade, I'm thinking about this in, in terms of, um, of those things, so steel in the energy transition and what that means uh, from an economic development standpoint, from a regional competitiveness, from a national competitiveness standpoint. So just uh, set the table for a second. Uh, in terms of projections for that green premium, which um, you know, we heard a little bit about, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about, how long will it take for that premium to go away? Um, looking like approximately 20% uh, uh, based on EU deals and high level market assessment that I checked out in advance of this panel. Um, as we see more deployment of low emission steel tech, the premium will decrease. So maybe we're looking at a 10 year window um, for countries to position for leadership and competitiveness, uh, but that window and the premium and its lasting effect, that'll vary and be regionally dependent. So with that sort of, uh, sort of setting, uh, I'll say, uh, let's, let's hit a couple categories here. Jobs and workforce. So in 2022, the steel industry supported about 83,000 direct jobs across 32 US states. So transitioning to cleaner production methods presents an opportunity for investment in some of the largest and most labor intensive facilities in this country, in any sector, right? These are big, these are employment engines, and that means supply chain, right? Not just the facilities themselves. So in doing the investment in new tech and in clean tech, there's an opportunity to not just retain these current employment levels, but add employment opportunities in steel and then in the upstream energy supply chain. So it's uh, significant from a jobs standpoint. And if it's good for the upstream energy supply chain, it's good for domestic steel manufacturing capacity, uh, it's good for building out manufacturing supply chains in the US for multiple sectors that have steel as a significant input and sectors where uh, green steel may be a required input. Domestic steel production helps facilitate indirect workforce opportunities as well in down steel, downstream steel fab and uh, finishing facilities, uh, numerous other labor intensive manufacturing sectors, autos, right? If you think about all the headlines we've been seeing over the last year and a half, two years that are Inflation Reduction Act related, steel are in those items. Other consumer products, energy infrastructure, heavy machinery and more. So we've got to have a steel industry domestically, but we also need to have a low emission steel industry domestically. We're gonna build up and build out the skills base. We're gonna capture more and spread more of these good jobs with career laddering opportunities. So jobs and workforce. From a competitiveness standpoint, so we're seeing um, foreign and domestic markets are demonstrating increasing demand 
for green steel, a willingness to pay that green premium for a low or near zero emission steel products, and as a differentiated market for steel products emerges that's green specifically, explicitly, uh, the cost of product will, uh, of production for the cleaner products will lower, competitiveness of emissions intensive coal-based steel will decline. So this is coming, it's happening, so we need to ensure competitiveness. We've got to advance our clean steel industry or risk being uncompetitive, right? These investments are going to happen. We want them to happen here. Um, we want to ensure that the U.S., not just the steel production, but the products that contain U.S. steel are competitive globally, uh, whether that's primary uh, or finished products. And, um, and, you know, we want to build out these supply chains here so other manufacturers can be reliant on those on, those, on that production. So the Inflation Reduction Act, which you've heard of a couple times uh, here today, and you've probably heard, I don't see any nodding heads, but you've probably heard about that uh, elsewhere. Uh, it helps with this. Uh, reliance on domestic steel sourcing is a fundamental strategy for many companies looking to maximize IRA benefits. Uh, there are several incentives that require U.S. sourcing minimums to qualify for federal funds in IRA, uh, also in the bipartisan infrastructure law. And the U.S. clean energy push to build uh, renewables out, to revamp its transmission infrastructure, to reshore industrial manufacturing uh, more broadly is incentivized uh, through IRA and others. Uh, and then and you heard um, uh, Joe's 40 uh, million tons of new steel demand that uh, RMI had projected between now and 2030. I mean, that's about 6.7 million tons a year. It's really uh, just enormous. It's hard to wrap your mind around. So. Um, Domestic uh, production requirements for iron, steel, and manufacturing products increasing over time with an IRA. And what we see from an analytical standpoint is as long as IRA's 45V is around the U.S. will be the cheapest place to produce green or low emission steel. This is a competitiveness play. This is big time, unignorable, like uh, get it done stuff. So then that leads me through this sort of economic development walkthrough to cluster development clean tech and clean energy cluster development, right? So we are at a point where we, in this country, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, get to build up and out and expand sectors, industrial sectors, uh, beyond having the opportunity to not repeat mistakes of every other industrial sector build out uh, in U.S. history, um, where underserved and disadvantaged communities are, are often left out uh, or bear the brunt. Um, this time we can do things different, but we have to do things. So on clusters, building out the low emission steel manufacturing supply chain, um, it will directly impact national competitiveness, but this happens in specific places, right? It's not on paper and it's not theoretical. These are places, regions, cities, uh, rural areas within states that will benefit by being part of critical manufacturing supply chain nearby. Um, U.S. Steel, with a stronger balance sheet, whoever buys it, will allow for greater investment in plant facilities and low emission steel production. You'll see R&D opportunities, more suppliers to the mills, um, more investment in inputs, more off-takers. These are jobs and CapEx. And then um, what we see um, with this announcement that was mentioned a couple times, the U.S. is now projected to have the only 100% green hydrogen steel-making facility outside of Sweden. This is um, big. This is the start. Um, we can be the global leader. We can scale this. Um, we can scale this more and better than elsewhere, um, and we should. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so this, I think, sets the stage for some some questions that I have, and I think perhaps the audience will have really nicely, so thank you all for your comments. Um, the letter that's on the table over there from uh, a number of different organizations calling on uh, the Biden administration to evaluate this potential sale of U.S. steel through a climate and health lens, can any of you walk us through what that would mean in sort of practical policy terms? You know, what are the sort of perhaps levers through which the, or, you know, I suppose what type of glasses could the administration where to actually bring that idea into into reality to sort of look at it through that lens well I guess that's a 
something that maybe I can start and perhaps I can also pass to my co-panelists. Uh, I think the, the, the lens that we would like the administration to take is consistency with its own policy stances. So the administration has a goal for the U.S. to reduce greenhouse gases alongside Paris Climate Agreement. So that is a goal that they should weigh these investments towards. The administration also has a goal to ensure that 40% of federal investments are going to uh, disadvantaged communities who are historically been disadvantaged. Now, this is like the investments in Granite City from whoever or, or other U.S. steel facilities isn't necessarily a federal investment, but I think the cons it, whatever does happen needs to be consistent with this commitment by the administration to take care of these communities that have been left behind through both legacy pollution and also deindustrialization over the past decades. So all we're asking, I think, through that letter is that the Biden administration stay committed to the promises that it had already made mm -hmm. and view these investments through that same consistent criteria. Do the processes, uh, well, everyone should weigh in on that as, as, as they will, but one, one uh, quick clarifying question was, do the current processes for evaluating such a large sale to a foreign buyer, whether it's the CFIUS process or uh, an antitrust examination, do any of these processes formally allow for that climate and health lens to be sort of brought to bear on the evaluation? Not to my knowledge. Okay. So if that's, does it then become something of a, uh, and I guess this is perhaps one of the reasons we're discussing this here and one of the reasons for the letter in this campaign, it sounds like this is more of a, um, uh, an effort to sort of convince the administration and to elevate the importance of these topics within the kind of discussion of this of, of this sale. Um, you know, another thing that I wanted to ask about was just at a very high level, you know, I think we've all heard a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act, but let me just ask a sort of silly question, but it's perhaps one that other people have as well. Certainly there are unprecedented tax incentives and other types of funding streams within the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. If U.S. steel is sold to a foreign buyer, could that foreign buyer also use those incentives to sort of help to decarbonize the U.S. holdings? Sorry, just, just to... Yeah, so let's say that Nippon Steel buys uh, U.S. Steel. Can Nippon Steel then say, okay, we are going to apply much greener, if, you know, I, I know that they have demonstrated um, what people feel is an, ina an inadequate commitment to doing so, so far. Mm -hmm. But let's say that they, or another buyer, were to say, okay, we do want to do the right thing here. We do want to sort of apply uh, the most advantageous technologies, which as you walked us through in your opening yes. comments, are increasingly becoming available at scale. Could they use the incentives through these statutes in order to, to do so? Do, do you mind if I go first? Right. So I, I will note that perhaps it, it, I think perhaps it's important to bring attention to the fact that there are foreign companies who are receiving Inflation Reduction Act benefits. So for instance, SSAB, who is building the green hydrogen DRI facility in Mississippi, is a Swedish company. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a foreign owned company that is receiving the benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act. Heidelberg Materials, that is receiving funding from the DOE for a project in Mitchell, Indiana, is a European company. Um, I think it doesn't forbid Nippon Steel from being a partner with the U.S. government in its efforts to both decarbonize and to usher in a just transition. I think it is just a question of whether or not Nippon Steel is willing mm -hmm. to do that. And I think that's like the first threshold. Yep. Um, and what we've seen to date is that their ambitions are insufficient for us to see them as a, as a, as a trusted partner yep. in that effort to date. Did you want to? I was going to say. Yeah, just the idea, the idea these are still American facilities with American workers using American raw materials to serve the American market. So, yeah, I think they would, whoever buys the facility should be eligible for these benefits. And we talked about IRA. Well, you drilled down a little bit on it. 45X, the tax credit, the 45V you talked about earlier, uh, OSED announcement that just came out last week. Anything that has not been announced yet will probably be announced by June. The Congressional Review Act takes effect in June. So whatever is remaining, it's going to be a very busy three months. So just, just for our audience, the, the Congressional Review Act being the law that says if an administration in their, toward the end of a presidential term, if they issue a regulation close to the end of that term, 
that it's a statute that allows Congress without needing, in a sort of filibuster-proof way, to overturn a regulation? That's yes, the, yeah. yeah, so you're looking at all the plan programs. A lot has been announced. Mm -hmm. A lot are still pending. Yeah. I don't know if it's June 1st or June 30th, but it's going to be, it's June something or other. And so a lot is going to be announced in a hurry. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to just go back to a point we heard. Uh, you know, so um, globally headquartered companies in America are American companies. Yeah. And um, of course, an American company is eligible for Inflation Reduction Act um, benefits and incentives. And in fact, you know, w one of the good things about the U.S. has been uh, a sort of a welcoming view and attitude towards companies uh, because they'll set up shop here and they'll expand here and they'll employ ultimately um, millions of American workers. And so, yeah, this is an opportunity for uh, Nippon Steel to to acquire an asset, um, and and then from there, what they do is what really matters, right? So, will they um, invest in those facilities and bring the latest tech um, to increase production, which is what we need, to green production, which is what we need? Um, you know that that's what remains to be seen, and um, and and I think that's arguably, you know, what we can benefit uh, by, by focusing on as, as part of this conversation. Um, I wanted to take a chance to see if anybody in the audience or joining us online has any, uh, has any questions. Cool. Well, I will, uh, uh, any, are there some questions online? Yeah. Um, you guys have brought up uh, SSAB. Great question. If I may, um, I don't think we are saying that we are for any company buying U.S. steel. I think we are going to have to look at it facility by, or rather company by company. Even with SSAB's commitments under with the DOE or their ongoing negotiations with DOE to receive grant funding to build this facility, it remains to be seen. We don't know the full details yet. We know that it's been announced. We know that there is a, an intent to do this, but we still need to see whether these companies have a clear community benefits plan in place and a community benefits agreement in place with local communities to ensure that some of the benefits are going to these local communities. We also need to assess whether these facilities are truly hitting the problem at the source of the problem with the emissions and both toxic pollution as well. So I think it's going to be a case-by-case -case scenario. So I, I don't want to name any facilities or a company that is a better buyer mm -hmm. without you know, studying what the, uh, the stated objectives and the, uh, the record has been for this company to date. To piggyback on that, we may differ a little bit on the process, but I think the end point is vitally important that we're looking at this from a U.S. and an ally perspective. So as long as we're able to frame this um, for a national security standpoint, um, we would take that in consideration. I mean, is, is it American-based, Canadian-based, as long as it's allies? Because we're just looking at the future of demand is continuing to grow. So where are, are we going to get that from? Yeah. And so there are plenty of actors that are trying to take the lead on this. Can we get the right policies in place? Is it, through, is it through green policies? Is it through the CBAs? Whatever that entails, we're looking at this to make sure that this is supporting the allies' effort as we take on a global production against adversaries. Um, following up on that, actually, Aaron, uh, I wanted to ask you, but also our other panelists as well. I mean, it seems to me one of the kind of central topics that's running through the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act and to perhaps to a lesser extent, but to a real extent, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is that we have an administration that has a very aggressive, that has set very aggressive climate change targets. We also, to some of the things we've also been discussing, has an have an administration that wants to see these supply, these supply chains domesticated or at least, you know, to the extent possible domesticated, but also making sure that we're getting materials from allies. Now, that holds true whether we're talking about electric vehicle battery components, whether we're talking about steel, whether we're talking about um, a lot of different materials. To what extent is rapid decarbonization 
inevitably going to collide with the industrial policy goals of the administration, or am I setting up a false collision that doesn't need to occur? I think you may be setting up a false collision that doesn't need to occur. Um, you know, um, we can have our cake and eat it too. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, whatever other fun analogy we can come up with, maybe something eclipse-related even. Um, but we have to do it, right? We have to want to do it, plan for it, and execute, and and um, be that place that is reliable and where investment happens in a predictable and transparent manner um, and be the United States of America where it's the destination of choice, right? So where capital goes uh, because it's well treated. The Inflation Reduction Act made the United States the global destination of choice in clean energy and clean tech. And that includes low emission steel. It is remarkable we are a juggernaut of economic activity, and we can be that in this sector. Agreed. I think if you're looking, if you're a producer, the challenge of doing this is all comes down to cost. All right, you've got the market that's calling for it. You're seeing demand pool calling for it. You have U.S. government support at levels we haven't seen before. You've got talk of the green premium. And just basic modernization of a facility is equal to, you hit on it perfectly, it's competitiveness. And so it just seems that the objections to do it, uh, you think hard, it's, they're just not that real. These are real money being spent by companies making investments. But the market, the, the environment, is there to do this now. Demand pool, government support, and competitiveness. The stars are aligning to do this now. One industry that's very much in the news with the transition to electric vehicles, but also just because the energy secretary is from Michigan, there's a whole lot of reasons why, you know, the, the, what the U.S. auto workers going to do. There's a lot of reasons why the auto industry is a very important actor in a lot of the debate over decarbonization and environmental policy. The auto industry also uses a lot of steel. Um, to what extent is that industry providing either headwinds or tailwinds to this effort to uh, have you know more green steel deployed and to sort of decarbonize the domestic sector? Well, if I may start, um, what we have saw, and perhaps this is shared by some of my co-panelists, perhaps not. But what we see is this, to date, a conversation that is happening between the steel producers and the auto companies where they're slightly talking past each other, mm. where the steel company says there's insufficient demand for green steel, yep. while the automakers say that there is insufficient amount of green steel being produced for us to ask for these uh, offtakes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that bridge is starting to happen, and we see it in places like the European Union, where yep. there are regulatory environments in place that forces some of the technologies to shift over, mm -hmm. where we see even American-based auto companies making offtake commitments for buying green steel when a green steel facility comes on board. Mm -hmm. uh, we are starting to see similar uh, discussions, uh, or rather, American car companies based in the United States open to such conversations. But I think it's, it's only at the very beginning stages, and I think we could see the steel and the other companies cooperate more to make it a tailwind yep. for offtake and production to take place simultaneously. And how about on an, another industry that needs a lot of steel and that there's a lot of interest in is the um, wind industry, and in particular the offshore wind industry. And here we have some of the largest energy companies in the world looking to develop projects off the Atlantic coast and, and elsewhere. Uh, is there also a conversation there between advocates of a decarbonized domestic steel industry and increasingly feeding offshore wind and other clean electrons to, uh, to the grid? I'm so glad you mentioned that, Ben. And I, I, I forgive me for like hogging the panel here. <laughs> But I think there is, there ought to be a greater conversation around offshore wind mm. and the use of green steel in that space. Offshore wind is one of those spaces where we do need primary steel produced from iron ore that can only be produced from, currently being only produced from blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace process. It cannot be really supplied from electric arc furnaces due to yield strength, Young's modulus, nerdy stuff that I can't go into right now. But it, it is absolutely a technological requirement that it be produced through these specific processes. It is a space that could really generate demand for green steel yeah. and DRI. I think there are 
uh, also certain requirements around the transport that also forces some of these green steel facilities to be located in places where offshore wind facilities might be installed, which also creates new opportunities for economic growth. So I think it is a space where we hope that in the United States there might be more conversation around. Uh, currently, we get a lot of the offshore wind pylon components from Europe uh, because they have a supply chain in place, but I think that could easily be uh, substituted by U.S. production. Thank you. Um, oh, yes, great. Uh, I was told by the organizers it was okay to do this. One. Absolutely. Oh, cool. So apologies, didn't mean to, uh, to, to hijack the panel. Uh, but I, you asked a direct question about sort of the legal basis for what the uh, environmental groups are asking. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that the, the CFIUS um, uh, statute is part of the Defense Production Act, which defines national security extremely broadly, mm -hmm. uh, including energy security and sort of maintenance of workforce. Uh, and so I think that, you know, and then to add to that, and President Biden in 2022 made an executive order that said that the CFIUS uh, mandate should be interpreted broadly to okay. think about sort of economic security, climate issues as well. So I think that what the groups are asking, and this is not to put words in uh, the Sierra Club's mouth, but I think what they are asking is that the, the administration just follow the letter of its own executive order and think broadly about the implications of the merger. So just thought, thought I'd throw that out there. Fascinating. Thank you. Todd Tucker from the Roosevelt Institute. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, another dimension of this that I wanted to uh, ask about is, you know, we've been talking a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act and the sort of uh, ability of that law to sort of move green steel forward. Is there a subsequent role for Congress that any of you see, right? I mean, should we look at it as the executive branch has all of the tools that it's going to need and it's just a question of political will and pressure, or is there still a role for Congress here in moving green steel forward? Oh, I think from the appropriation standpoint, yes, from the appropriation standpoint, uh, Defense Production Act was mentioned. That needs to be continuously funded. Uh, so there's clearly an easy way. There is an A way to do it that way. Um, there may be some other legislative angles, but just thinking through the fastest and most efficient, uh, we're seeing Defense Production Act as the answer, mm -hmm. as long as it's funded. Yeah. So from an appropriation standpoint, yes. Aaron, I'm, oh, a, a, a question I wanted to ask you about was, um, you know, a, a big focus of, the, or one of the focuses of this administration and just a lot of discussion in general, in fact, there's a new interesting research initiative that I was just writing about at looking at the fact that you've got a lot of communities in the U.S. that are highly reliant upon either fossil extraction or use and how those communities can continue to thrive or at least not be put at risk by energy transition. You mentioned the many economic opportunities around a cleaner steel industry. To what extent would that clean steel industry be using the same workforce as the traditional steel industry? I mean, potentially to a great extent. Um, and, and <clears throat> you know, what places need in this moment is an economic development strategy that directly addresses how the energy transition may be impacting, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, but there are economic opportunities, there are positive, and there are potential negative implications, and it's not a snap of the fingers, but it can be gradual. So if as your, your city, state, county, or region, um, does not have a comprehensive economic development strategy that directly addresses the energy transition, then that's, a, that's an oversight and it needs to be addressed. And, but it's through such a process that places can determine their clean tech and clean energy competitiveness, which sectors, and these are some of the fastest growing um, surging industries in America right now, which of these sectors will make the most sense for a uh, for place and why, and that will dictate some of that place's city, state, county, or region's economic development strategy, their key and priority sectors for attraction, what economic incentives may or may not be offered. So, you know, um, uh, I would say, you know, you asked this question about Congress, but, you know, there are also roles that governors can play. Governors are the economic development leaders in their states. And uh, many states in the U.S. are world-class in terms of building out 
industrial sectors through business attraction, retention, and expansion. And uh, that oftentimes uh, includes uh, provision of incentives. And so making the most of those taxpayer-funded incentives at the state level um, will pay significant dividends uh, in the energy transition and um, allow states to sort of moderate their exposure, maximize the benefits, and minimize any, any potential um, downfalls. Oh, please. Yeah, if I may add on to what Aaron was saying, um, the DOE grants that we kept referring to earlier throughout the panel in our discussion, like part of the community benefits that these companies that are receiving these federal grants can offer is workforce training with, in partnership with uh, unions and labor unions. And my friends here in the room from Blue Green Alliance can give you the exact number on how many grant projects already have partnerships with unions. Mm -hmm. But I think that is one way we overcome some of the, uh, the gaps that may exist in the new technologies and the labor requirements there and the existing technologies and the current labor force that we have. So I think that's a great uh, space where there, it offers a pathway for the federal investments to also support this workforce development that occur. And if I may just quickly touch on your earlier question on what Congress can do, I do want to remind audiences and the panel here that like, the IRA funding sunsets eventually. There is an end to this. And it is on Congress to renew that funding, those programs, those resources that have been made available to workers, to the communities, or rather to those facilities to give to the workforce and to communities. I think it's on Congress to really renew that and to, um, to give these programs that are successful a pathway to continue supporting the industries as this transition happens over and beyond 2030. Um. Yeah, speaking of Congress, actually, I mean, I think one thing that uh, while the Inflation Reduction Act doesn't sunset for quite a while, that said, I think we have some perhaps near-term uh, forcing or driving events that could renew discussion around a lot of things in Congress. You know, in 2025, we're going to have the Trump some of the Trump tax cuts expiring, so there's going to be a discussion about reauthorization there. We're going to have a debt ceiling fight, most likely, unfortunately. Uh, th there's going to be a lot happening on Capitol Hill in 2025, and so I, I, I guess I would wonder is that going to be a sort of venue for help, you know, getting some of these things through Congress or at least having them in the mix when these discussions are happening? Uh, yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> our, 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 our plan's already underway to, yes. to, to make, yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're just a stone's throw from the headquarters of the Chamber of Commerce and a lot of other, you know, the, the business roundtables here in DC. There's a lot of very powerful sort of K Street business organizations. There's obviously a coalition that already exists um, and that is well represented here today trying to push forward decarbonization of steel. Are there any other actors, perhaps the ones I just mentioned, perhaps others, that right now we should be looking at more that are either potential um, people that could, I suppose, join the team on some level or are, I guess I should ask just, you know, more bluntly, is, is the chamber and the business roundtable and the other K Street powerhouses playing a, a constructive role on, on, on any of the sort of goals we've walked through, of whether it's on the security side, on the economic side, or on the, on the carbon side? I don't, I'm, I'm not tracking what they're... Yeah. Joe, what, did you, do you see a, a no, role for these big K Street powerhouses? It's, uh, I wasn't thinking about the business sector. I was thinking of the national security sector. Yeah. Uh, the Department of Defense can play a huge role. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, but yeah, sorry. Go, when go it on. comes to procurement policies, um, when it comes to uh, preferable treatment of materials. Um, so a, a group that we're trying to get more involved in this would be on the, on the defense side. Uh, the business community, I likely I also have not been tracking. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the Defense Department, actually. I, I, that was something I wanted to ask about. I mean, one thing that I, I, I have not tracked Defense Department procurement of green materials, but I have written some and looked at some of their procurement of, of renewable electricity, of um, alternative transportation fuels, and so that's a, actually a sort of long-winded way of asking, to what extent can DOD, which is needless to say a gigantic <laughs> buyer of all kinds of things, to what extent can they sort of play a role here? Uh, a significant role, I think, just uh, with their existing procurement policies, are they able to secure the materials that they need? Uh, is Are there some tweaks that can be made to those policies to further incentivize domestic, clean steel and aluminum? Um, and I think it's important not only for the direct purchasing and those policies, but also the market signal, mm -hmm. that there is a demand for these things. 
And so we put a lot of eggs in that auto basket, as we rightly should. Yeah. But how do we show a diversification of uh, massive, massive end users? I believe DOD can play a role in that. You know, uh, obviously we have an election coming up. Um, to what extent is the ability to decarbonize the U.S. steel sector at stake in either direction in the, uh, in the 2024 election? Um, w w and, and I should say, not just decarbonize, but I mean, if you're sort of looking at the different goals that you've all walked us through in different ways, which is that making sure that, uh, Aaron, making sure that communities economically benefit from this transition or making sure that we don't become overly reliant on, on other actors who are not our allies. From any of these standpoints, and please take this where you will, uh, to what extent would a change in power in Washington either help or hinder those goals? I, mean, I just think whatever happens, we need to keep our eyes on the prize that this is an incredibly important industry and the industry is undergoing transition, like it or not, and we need to maintain U.S. competitiveness in this industry. And that means, like in any other industry, when such change happens, we have to make sure that we're investing in the latest tech we integrate a workforce development strategy, that there are these community benefits, that it becomes an economic development priority, uh, and that we have an expanding sector with expanding production that is green. Uh, we can have those things. And, and wouldn't it be great to take the politics out of it uh, so that we can have this, this thriving sector? Thank you. I, I see optimism. Whoever wins, they'll continue to prioritize green, green domestic steel. Uh, and I say that because if you look at the Section 232 tariffs that the Trump administration imposed, uh, those of us in the metal space assumed, as soon as the Biden administration walks in, it's going to be the first thing they do, they'll throw it out. Yeah. Well, no, they have not thrown it out. They've ridden it pretty hard and tried to turn it into the global arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminum. I think that speaks to the importance of uh, materials production, domestic production, national security, green processing, all the themes. Details matter. Yes, there'll be some changes on the margins based on, you know, just a, a glossary overlook of that. But I would think that was such a, uh, almost a toxic issue that you would assume that'd be the first one to be thrown out, and it wasn't. So given the, the mix of issues that are involved in it, uh, I think this will, this will go through uh, regardless of who wins. Of what, do you, what do you see as the election stakes? Well, not to contradict uh, my co-panelists, but perhaps to just throw a little bit of caution to the wind. I think whoever wins the election and is in power in 2025 will have to be someone who's not only dedicated to decarbonization, but also reducing toxic pollution and jobs development and just transition. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because there are many paths to decarbonization. In the medium term, the, the reduction of carbon emissions from these pathways will look very, will not look too dissimilar from one another. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, some of these pathways that do not reduce toxic pollution, that do not re require workforce training and just transition, have a clear ceiling to where they can reduce carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And only an administration and policymakers who are truly committed to the trifecta of creating a new workforce, workforce development, reducing climate emissions, and also reducing climate pollution will actually take us to the true path to jobs, just and, jobs justice, and climate. And for that reason, I, I hold deep uh, anxiety over the election going to the way of Donald Trump and his, you know, many of his supporters who not only refuse to acknowledge climate change, but also have not shown too much care for regulation around toxic releases, around workforce training, and other things like that. That dovetails really nicely with another question that I wanted to, to toss to the panel. But first, I wanted to see if we have another. Oh, hey. Um, hi. Uh, I'm now, we are, I am now excited to introduce our uh, final speaker. Um, let me introduce uh, Jermaine Patterson. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all too. Yeah. Uh, Jermaine is a community health worker with, the, with Valley Clean Air Now and a resident of Clareton, Pennsylvania. 
and she brings deep and firsthand experience and knowledge with the impacts of U.S. steel and other industrial sources to the communities and residents of, of that area. And um, uh, with that, I would just like to sort of toss it to you for some uh, comments. Okay, so first I'd like to say I'm a community health worker with Women for a Healthy Environment. Um, that's, that's incorrect there, that's all oh, right. Sorry, sorry <laughs> I'm a community health worker with Women for a Healthy Environment. Um, I am on the steering committee of Valley Clean Air now. Um, I've been a resident of the Mon Valley for all of my life, and I've been a resident of spe specifically of Clariton, which is where U.S. Steel resides, uh, for 19 years. Um, I started working as a community health worker right before the pandemic, and with that came a lot of awakening for me um, in terms of the health impacts. Um, can I have some water? Okay. I'm sorry. I just sped down uh, 495, so. <laughs> Glad you made it. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm able to see um, some of the firsthand health experiences are um, the, the detriment that pollution does to community members. Um, Claritin is an environmental justice community. Um, it's a food desert. Uh, there's a lot of plighted buildings and homes. Um, and so to have those experiences on top of um, having uh, health impacts is, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's unfair. Um, it's, I, you see, I, I would have worn a suit today, but I, I wanted to make a statement. Um, individuals deserve to breathe clean air. Um, I, as a community health worker, my main focus is on air pollution and asthma in children, um, but it's not limited to that. Um, but that's what we're talking about today, right? Air pollution. Um, so Claritin has an asthma clinic in the school, so that's how prevalent it is, um, and that's that's unheard of. Um, not only Claritin, but there's other school districts surrounding the um, U.S. Steel um, Works within the county that we live in that also has um, asthma clinics. Um, I know at, at least four residents who have scar scar soy doses. And that is directly linked to um, coal byproducts. Um, and, I, and I have here, um, so me personally, um, thank God I don't have any major illnesses. However, during the pandemic, I, um, I thought I had COVID, right? I thought I had COVID, um, was a little afraid. And so I went to a Med Express and um, the doctor, without really knowing where I lived at, told me that I had environmental, uh, environmental allergies. Um, so I suffer from environmental allergies. What that looks like for me is um, my voice comes and goes, right? Um, sometimes I have um, throat irritation. Um, my left eye always is um, irritated and I, I I think it's inflammation in my eye. Um, so those are some of the things, but there's a lot of community um, residents who experience far worse than that. Um, I just want to, to read, so this, this document, um, one of our VCAN members, um, Sanan Dagan, he actually um, put this together and it actually talks about some of the, the, um, the health impacts um, and I just want to read the first paragraph. Um, previous epidemiological um, studies have linked exposure to Coke oven emissions with several adverse health outcomes, including chronic obstruction pulmonary diseases, lung function decline, hypertension, cancers, and neurobehavioral function impairments. Additionally, high levels of heavy metals and metalloids um, found in the environment surrounding coking 
plants could po could can pose health risk to nearby communities through various biological pathways. Um, and you know, there's, he he states where he gets this information as well. And children, exposure to air pollution raises the likelihood of developing conditions such as leukemia, autism spectrum disorders, hypertension, ear infections, obesity, pneumonia, asthma, respiratory diseases, eczema, and allergy. And it, this actually brought to mind um, with myself something I, I forgot. So this is serious. Um, so I'm, I'm considered an older mom. I have three children. And after I had my third child, by the way, she was actually the only one who was born in Clareton. Um, after I had my third child, and even during, I was, when I was carrying her, I started to experience heart palpitations. And, I've, and my, my doctor didn't know, right? I thought I was linked to me being an older mother, um, older as an age. Um, but when I started to learn about pollution and the effects that pollution have on um, you know, the heart, I, I put two and two together. And then I started to notice, right? Okay, this is a horrible day. Yeah, my heart is palpitating. So, and I'm, I'm not the only one who experiences that. The only thing is there are, I know, I know there are community members who don't know that there is a connection. Um, and and that's, the, that's the sad part, um, that there's a lot of illnesses and ailments that are linked, but people, people aren't aware of it. Um, and, and that's what you know, um, organizations are trying to do, like Women for a Healthy Environment, like Valley Clean Air Now. We're trying to educate the community in terms of um, the health impacts that they are experiences experiencing or linked to, um, you know, being surrounded by the um, industry. And it's, you know, it's, it's not being talked about, um, the health impacts, not only to the community, but workers who are coming from outside of the community, um, you know, working. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's about people's health, not just, you know, those who are in the community. Thank you. Um, given the problems, the health effects that you have seen and the health effects that others in the community have seen as well, um, has U.S. Steel been responsive or acknowledged these impacts? And what, is, what has been your interaction with them? And um, you know, to what extent, uh, yeah, so let me, let me start there. I would say no. <laughs> um, no, um, because acknowledging it would be admitting, right? Um, and then they would probably see lots of lawsuits, I'm sure, if they admitted that. Um, I mean, they, they do things like um, paint, paint the schools and you know, very small, minute things. And, and they pay to pollute, basically. Um, VCAN, Valley Clean Air Now, um, we have done air filter distributions to community members and we continue to do that. Um, the organization that I work for, Women for a Healthy Environment, um, one of the things that I do is I go into the home and do a healthy home assessment with families. And with that healthy home assessment, we ask about a variety of things, you know, within the household that may be impacting a family's health. Um, but if there is a child in the home with asthma, we can provide them with an air filter um, and with several other, other things that may be triggers for asthma. And to, to what extent is the... Um are the, is the pollution, the, the, the localized health impacts related to the U.S. steel facility sort of um, being compounded by other industrial uh, pollution sources in the area? I don't know if I can answer. Well, it's definitely being compounded. Um, you just think about the, um, the vehicles that come up and down the street from the industry. Um, you know, the larger trucks, the, um, it's, it's being com compounded by those. What would you like, you know, given that we're, you know, we're, we've got this um, upcoming board vote on, on the U.S. steel sale, and mm -hmm. given that, um, you know, there might be, whether it's Nippon Steel or another buyer, what, what would you hope is going to be achieved by this sale in terms of mitigating some of these, uh, some of these harms? Um, mitigation for sure. Mm -hmm. um, not continuing the legacy of paying to pollute. 
Um, and, and, and just looking at it from the, the, um, the view of those who are being impacted um, and think about what if your family was here? Um, compassion, <laughs> you know, at the least. Um, it's, I mean, it's her God-given right. Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned a number of the different sort of health impacts. When you began this work in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, how long did it take before you sort of realized that different people were all sort of telling and experiencing a version of the, of, of the same thing? Was it immediately apparent or was it a more sort of investigative process? Um, it wasn't immediately apparent and that's because of COVID. Mm. Um, you know, um, starting a new position, um, we went virtual, you know, right, right after I started. So it wasn't immediate, um, but the more education I received, the more I realized it. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to see if we had any other uh, audience questions, or uh, audience and online. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I heard the... the... Uh, yeah, so uh, President Biden and former President Bush are both uh, courting the USW vote. Uh, what role does the transition to sustainable steel play in 2024 in states like Pennsylvania and Ohio and other steel producing states? Oh, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know all of the uh, technicalities, of, but just just a change would make a difference. Um, yes, just a change alone would make a difference through, throughout the county. Has the, um, the congressional delegation been responsive? Whether the, uh, yeah, have, have, have they been responsive to these concerns or is there a channel through which they've even investigated Some them? Some have been responsive, yes. Care to name? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's Summer Lee, mm -hmm. who has been very responsive. Um, and you know, I I apologize because I'm I'm having a blank. But I the first person I can think of is Summerlee. Really. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other? I mean, I think one of the sort of reasons um, that cleaning up these kind of hard to decarbonize sectors, but also addressing their local impacts, can be a challenge, is because there are often sort of multiple stressors in the in 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 the same region. What are some of the other? Uh, you know, obviously U.S. Steel is a, is a huge player, but what are some of the other kind of stressors that, you know, what are some of the other kind of, you mentioned vehicles. Is it, is oil and gas development in the state also uh, sort of at play in this kind of mix of things that are affecting people? Yes, it is, definitely, yes. But I would say that U.S. Steel was the, the biggest player. Yeah. Um, do we have another, oh, sorry. Um, oh, or do we, uh, I think we're going to start, um, to start to wrap these up, I think we're going to bring uh, Hillary back up for some um, closing comments. Thank you. Um, thanks to our wonderful panel. This was a great conversation. Um, I hope that everyone is taking away a few new things to keep in mind when thinking about the U.S. steel sale, a potential sale, um, and how that might impact both the climate and community health. Um, one of the things that I heard a lot about was uh, how this also impacts competitiveness. So thinking about climate and health, often we think about costs, but this is actually an opportunity for the U.S. to have an advantage in the global market and bring a product that people are willing to buy at a, a higher price. So this is um, an opportunity for us to continue to invest in communities, grow our economy, um, and clean up the air all at once. Um, I did wanna um, add that there are some upcoming events. So um as a just as a plug um at the end of the week there's uh the vote for by u.s steel shareholders um and there's going to be um, a concurrent event from with advocates from the pittsburgh area that are hosting a people's vote 
outside of the US Steel headquarters in Pittsburgh on Friday at noon. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to tune into that. And I also wanted to remind everyone that you can find a copy of the letter that was sent to the Biden administration online and in the back of the room. Um, and again, I just wanted to say thank you to Jermaine and Aaron and Joe and Young and Ben for this great conversation. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you. And we are clear at the press club. Thank you very much. Great job.